church right now that our Lord will not be filled with her uh, passing and uh, we miss her dearly. Uh, it's been much prayer for God. It will bring us comfort in all the sad and hearts of our lives. Uh, also, pray for Pastor Mike, keep him in prayers, uh, for, for spiritual guidance as well as uh, good health. Uh, he had a wonderful message for us today, so open ears and hearts. If you may pass the message and send the word you can give us today. Also, uh, continue to pray for Sharon Dobson and uh, Kim Glover, keep them in your prayers. Sister Ruth and uh, her son is Mike and uh, Matthew. Like I say, Sister Ruth is traveling, so keep her in your prayers. Uh, you may mention, uh, mention Wednesday night that she was concerned about making this trip with her bed. We pray that God will give her a uh, safe trip there and back, but no problem with her bill. Remember, Judge Jerry, keep him in the prayers of Sandra. Uh, Carolyn Armisen, uh, keep her in the prayers. Uh, remember our caregivers, uh, they're doing a wonderful, nation job of caring for those sick and afflicted. So keep them in the prayers. Uh, those are the, the prayer list in your bulletin. Uh, and, uh, in your daily prayers, uh, please keep them in your prayers as well. Pray for each other and each other's families. Uh, we're going through some very uh, uh, difficult and trying times right now. So all of each one we need prayers. And uh, pray that, uh, that God will uh, protect and guide me and bless each and every one of us to give us strength and courage to face each and every day with all the things that Satan can put in front of us. Uh, also, I would like to say that if there's one amongst us that's not saved today and they're here in God's house of worship, morning uh, during the service I would like you to shut your heart and mind where is Christ standing in your life if he's first and foremost that's wonderful and great if he's not then he should be uh, if you're in the pew and uh, I know Satan will try to keep you there but you feel the urge to get up out of that pew come down to the altar and confess your sins and accept Christ as your personal Savior do not let Satan hold you in that pew Feel free to give us, God give you the strength. If you really, really want to come down, God will give you the strength. Get out of that pew, put you right here. So pray for that, shut your hearts and minds. Uh, the thing thing else that uh, you need prayer for right now, if somebody is in need of prayer, I'll give you an opportunity to make that done at this time. Tim? Yes, uh, Johnny Sellers family. She's actually in therapy herself to learn how to do these things again. 
so she needs strength and prayer to get her through these next two weeks because she's limited on what she can do for him. Father, I stand before you. I heard a need. 
needs and petitions and concerns, especially my brothers and sisters in your house here today, Heavenly Father, Lord. Because we face concern, Heavenly Father, Lord, they have so much burden they are carrying right now, the worry that is on their shoulders right now, Heavenly Father, Lord. I take this opportunity to lift each and every one of to you this hour, Heavenly Father, Lord. And ask that your healing power be a minister to the sick and afflicted. That your guys be a minister to the lost and misguided souls. And let your burdens be lifted from the shoulders of your children who are trying to carry them on their own, Heavenly Father, Lord. We do try to do things on our own, but we know we will, we'll fail if we try. We've got to be true to you in all that we try to do, Heavenly Father, Lord. You're our source of strength and guidance. We need to do it with you and look to you for all the strength we need so desperately to get us through the day and through the troubled times we're in. Lord, Heavenly Father, I know that each one of these uh, children in your house here today, that the concern they have and what is heavy on their heart and mind, and they're concerned about the sick and afflicted. They're concerned about the those that's traveling and got to be traveling by branch or the other two. Those that are uh, sick and, uh, and uh, misguided, Heavenly Father, Lord, we know, Heavenly Father, we need to reach out to them and touch them and guide them in the direction that we would have them to go. So we need guidance from you in order to do this. So we pray for guidance from you, Heavenly Father, Lord, we may be able to achieve the mission that you placed before us. Give us the strength and the tools that we need to accomplish this mission. We want to be better, great and better servants to you, Heavenly Father, Lord. And we know that if you ask us to do something, we willingly should be willing to do it and be obedient to you. And not be afraid to do it because we have lack of experience or knowledge. And pray not fail in this attempt. But we should not worry in this area. If you call us to do something, Heavenly Father, Lord, you're going to give us all we need to keep us to fulfill that mission and accomplish it well and, uh, and succeed in it. We thank you so much for that, Heavenly Father, Lord. And Lord, we thank you for the, the, your children in your house here today. We thank you for the, the time they take to come to worship you closely and glorify your precious name. We thank you for the protection you show in our children. Your children, Heavenly Father, Lord, and those we love, that we can follow that speech and that you won't break from it. We see that your hand of power and your miracles are still at work today. We just got to have strength and faith and trust and love in you, knowing that you're going to come through with our request and our prayers are going to be answered through your grace and your glory. And Lord, Heavenly Father, just give us the, the guidance that we need. To fulfill all the duties and places before us. The God we need to make it through the day with all the saints that we have. The God we need to help others in need. The God we need to reach out and protect those in need. Protect those that are lost and misguided. And Lord, we just ask you to do it. We ask you to do it. We thank you for each and every time the opportunity we have to serve you. We thank you for our food bank and our church. All these programs that we have to, to help you, to help you follow the Lord, who's in need of those who are really hungry and starving. But you provide the food for them and meet that need, help you follow the Lord. And we're so glad to be a part of that. To be able to help fulfill your needs and your Lord, I ask you once again,
It's a real yeah. way. <laughs> it's rough being our age and still looking so good. I don't know what we're going to do, brother. <laughs> This past week on the news, I saw something that it's becoming a frequent occurrence in Canada. And as goes Canada, soon will follow California and then, of course, the rest of the United States. At one of their, I was telling them on Wednesday night, at one of their drag time reading hours, a pastor showed up and said, Look, we don't need to be presenting this stuff to children. And he was abruptly, very abruptly, escorted out by three huge men. For all intents here in the United States, they would have been charged with sexual assault. But guess who gets a visit to their house and arrested? The preacher, who did nothing. He fought back none. He was just simply there to say, look, we don't need to be teaching our kids certain things. And guess what? They put him in jail. Our time of freedom is swiftly closing. Our time, our freedom of speech is really just an illusion anymore. We've learned that very quickly in the last few years. If you go against a certain narrative that is being put out, they will silence you by any means necessary. And so I will speak. How can we still live a godly life and have a godly testimony in the ungodly world? That is the question we must ask ourselves and must be prepared not just to answer it, but to follow through with it. It's easy to give an answer, but it's much different when somebody's up in your grill. I'm speaking from personal experience now. <laughs> Suddenly, your faith is put to the test. Our faith is being tested. The same has come, Jesus said to his disciples, to sift you out. He's still sifting. But I'm telling you, God still loves him. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know how God works? He, he sort of got this so cool. I know that sounds almost like uh, they ought to be so awesome. How about that's better? Mm -hmm. I had a certain verse that had been going through my head. Actually, two of them, but one in particular I had marked down. And yesterday morning, I went with my uncle to Northside. They had men's breakfast on Saturday morning. And their associate pastor got up, and guess what verse he preached out of? <laughs> so, well, there you go. That's your affirmation, buddy. We've been, and ironically, we have been in this book on Wednesday nights now for a few weeks. Um, God kind of gave us a detour from where we had been at. And so if you would turn with me to James, the, the epistle of James right there before the end, right near Revelation. Go back a few pages and you'll be there. And we're going to look at chapter 1. We're going to be at a couple of short verses and then I'm going to take you the Old Testament for a couple of verses, and the two would never seem to comport together, yet you cannot separate one from the other. To lay out some understanding for you of what has happened, a lot of people say well, we don't live in Old Testament times, so they ignore the Old Testament, and that is a horrible mistake. We're no longer under the dietary laws of the Old Testament. We're no longer under the ceremonial and sacrificial, which was your ceremonial laws of the Old Testament. However, we are still under the moral laws of the Old Testament. In other words, what God said was proper behavior back then, he completes it all the way through the Bible. He doesn't change his mind about moral behavior. And really, he didn't change his mind about ceremonial and dietary requirements. He just fulfilled them through his son, Jesus Christ. So what we're going to find is there are certain attributes as Christians, mature Christians, we need to examine. 
exemplified. James, of all the epistles, he was the baby brother of Jesus. And if you do a little bit of research on him, you'll find he was one of the last ones to actually believe in Jesus. Well, that would be ironic, but it makes sense in a way. How many of you have ever had a sibling? I don't know if you ever found this on the internet. It seems like they did everything right. And you did everything wrong. You know, there's that little bit of sibling rivalry going on. Well, try being a sibling to the Son of God. You think you had it bad? <laughs> he really had it bad growing up. <laughs> Why aren't you like your brother Jesus? Well, we don't share the same father. <laughs> He had a good excuse anyway. So here he is writing, and his book is the most pointed on how Christians should behave. Not only to God, but one another. And it helps us to identify what this behavior should look like. And if you read James, you will know that most of what he's talking about is what? Bridling the tongue. <laughs> that, that really, if I wanted to get to the meat of the message, and that's really what he's talking about. But he gives much more than that. So I want you to turn with me to verse 19. And we're just going to read two verses out of here because all we need to know about a mature Christian and a mature Christian response in the ungodly world is found in these two verses. <clears throat> it says here, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, and right there we need to stop because that, I want to go ahead and set the stage for you. When he's here to say, he is speaking to say folk. Remember, he will never say brethren if he ain't saved. So now he's talking to saved folk that are not acting right. And he's ready to give them a little lecture on proper Christian behavior. Because trust me, in case you haven't noticed, the world is looking at us. And they absolutely savor when the church, somebody in the church messes up. They will come and report on us giving food to the needy every Monday, but let one of them do something wrong. Get a DUI or something. I guarantee we'd have reports crawling all over out here. That's just the way our world works because it's under the sway of the wicked one. You understand, we are in a battle. I think this past week, more than ever, I've realized just how real that battle is. It can manifest itself in many ways. And the enemy is very sneaky. And God can use anybody, but so can the devil. And that doesn't even include saved people. He can use anybody. If a saved person does not keep their fellowship with God, they can be used of the devil. And that's something, that's something we need to understand. We're, we're operating from a place of either the the Holy Spirit or a demonic spirit, and they will know us by the fruits we bear. This is a sharp message, but it's to the point because it will affect our relationships one with another. Now, yesterday he used it in the context of husband and wife because it was men's day and it was mostly about how to. Preach your spouse properly, and he brought out some great points. One I had never thought of, never realized. If you ever wonder why, we're going to get to the scripture in a second here, why your wife thinks a little different than you do, never realized this. But did you realize when God kicked them out of the garden, women got four unique curses that we didn't get? Now we got our own. But women are dealing with four separate things that are written in the Word that we don't have to deal with. And what he's saying is we have to envy ourselves of ourselves sometimes and listen. That's a hard thing to do because we are reactionary in our very being, especially if at any point we feel threatened, we react. Y'all quiet. I don't know about that one this morning. Y'all just sort of. <laughs> All right, I'm going to start something with the poor like the bishop. Maybe I'll wake y'all. Listen to this. Wherefore, my 
beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. And then he goes on to say in verse 20, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. He gives us a quick three point examination tool. As we've often heard, God gave us two ears and just one mouth so that we can listen twice as much as we speak. <laughs> but it's hard. Many times we feel like we must argue and, and get our point across. And sometimes, especially when it comes to personal relationships, we need to step back sometimes and say, is this even worth it to begin with? What's our end game? Is it just to be right now? I'm speaking more along the lines of spousal relationships. I'm, I mean, you gave me some great thoughts to carry with me yesterday. By the way, it's first Sunday of every month at 8 o'clock. And they gave a great message and a great breakfast. And it's just a donation of $5. Then you guys want to join me? I'm saying I'm going back. You know, it helps to hear the word sometimes. Preachers need to be preached to as well sometimes. Y'all hear? It's good to get that fresh, fresh thought. And first, we need to be swift to hear. And what does hear from the Bible come from? Well, Romans 10, 17 tells us what he's talking about here. He was, might have even been quoting from there. He says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When he's talking about swift to hear, we need to be listening to the Word of God and to the Spirit of God. If we're not listening to those two things, odds are we're listening to something we don't need to hear. How many times is our face buried in our phone hearing things we don't need to hear? I'm not being ugly. I've done the same thing. It doesn't necessarily mean it's out and out bad, but it's a distraction. You understand the enemy, he doesn't come to the church to save folk with horns in the pitchfork. He doesn't really go to the world because they're already following him. When he comes to a saved person, what does he do? He disguises himself as an angel of light. Well, why did Jesus call himself the light of the world? So he's trying to create that persona. That he is religious. Friends, there is a difference between a religious person and a righteous person. A lot of religion in the church, religious people crucified Jesus. The righteous people wanted to see him live. Amen. They loved him. Seven times to all the churches, we hear the phrase in Revelation, he who has an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. The first question I would ask you this morning as a believer, are you listening to what God's saying? Or are you consumed with an agenda? It's easy to get consumed with our own agendas. I'm guilty as charged. Man, sometimes I get on high speed and all of a sudden God puts the brakes on me and says, wait a minute, hold on. Let's examine ourselves. Mike, I want you to go this way, but you're heading 100 miles an hour down this way. I'm going to slow you down a minute and I'm going to turn you around. I'm going to send you the other way. He's going to do that to you too. Seven times he would say that to the church. But did you know that there's a, a importance not only in what God says, but the order. He says, I don't think it, it was any coincidence how he phrased this one verse. The first thing to being a godly Christian and a first sign in your step to being a mature Christian is that you are a good listener. If you can't listen, then you've got some work to do. God's got some work to do on you. There is some submission that needs to happen to God and to the authority that he 
has established. We must listen. Listen to what he says over in verse 22, one of the best known verses in all the Bible. But he ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. Boy, he gets to the mark there, don't he? We need to hear the word, but then we need to do the word. I can tell you how to drive an 18 wheeler, but until you get behind that rig, you ain't gonna know how to drive it. I promise you, you will take out half the, the telephone poles and stop signs in town. There's no joke turning them things around. If you manage to get it past this gear, because it's a trip. It ain't like driving a five speed, by the way. <laughs> Unless it's all magic, or all one of say. You try driving a 10 speed truck. It was hilarious that first few times out as students. I, I don't know how the trucks keep the transmission in because all you do is grind every gear on the way up and all the way down. It's pretty scary. So I mean, we need to be good listeners, one to another. And to listen to one another, that means we have to empty ourselves of ourselves. And to be a good listener to God, we've got to take out our agenda. I have heard people that can quote scripture. As a matter of fact, I have witnessed sometimes, believe it or not, to some drunks that were drunk as a skunk and they could quote the Bible better than most people in church could. And that's a sad commentary, but it's the truth. I'm going to go ahead and tell it. But just because you can quote the truth doesn't mean you were living the truth. And so we need to have our actions match what we're speaking and what we're listening. The next thing he talks about is speech. Slow to speak. Did you know the actual translation for that, a better translation for speak there is be slow to murmur. What is murmur? Complain. Now, when you get right down to it, we shouldn't complain at all. Truth is, we have so much, we ought to always have praise in our lips. Amen. But James understood us well enough to know that when we're still dealing with this sin nature, we will till we die or until we're raptured up. And that we were going to be complaining every once in a while about something. So he's saying, at least make it slow. Don't do it all the time. You know, try and keep it to a minimum. Please, thank you very much. <laughs> who wants to hang around somebody who complains all the time? How does it look for a Christian to always be complaining? Does that speak highly of the glory of God? That's why he says, be slow to speak. And then finally, and probably the most important one is slow to wrath. And boy, this one hit on me, but in a way I can look back and say, and I can honestly say this, and I'm not patting myself on the back end of self-righteous way because I've still got a lot of work to do. But my fuse is a lot longer than it was 20, 30 years ago. I'm not proud of this, but I'm going to be honest with you. I used to have a nasty temper. And that's one of the hallmarks. Right now, you're talking to the safe, so we know that even a safe person can have a really nasty disposition. How many times have we witnessed that? Expect this. I'm not He's talking about me. <laughs> Tell me I'm already calling on myself. I'm confessing. But a quick temper is something that needs to be brought into submission. It's something you have to work at, and it does get better as time goes. If you will spend the time to work at it and ask the Holy Spirit to help you get it under control. Does that mean it's going to be gone? No, because the devil won't quit. We're still living in the flesh, and there's going to be times when we're driving on the road and somebody cuts us off or something, or somebody gets in our grill and, and hits that last nerve. And we've all got that last nerve going ahead and tell the truth. The Lord loves you anyway. 
And you man, you want to hug them so tight, they turn all kinds of different colors. You ever just want to do that? Just, you love them to death? <laughs> Let's just be real. Let's be real. Because God can deal with real. And we're going to see why when we go to the Old Testament in a minute. Did a quick tip or something to bring into submission. Did you know that there are over 100 verses in the Bible that speak of being slow to anger? You think that's important to God? Because most of them have to do with God himself being slow to anger. If you are being put to anger, you are not exhibiting a Christ-like attitude. And it needs to be adjusted. Either God's going to adjust it, or one way or the other, he's going to straighten you out. It's much easier when you just go ahead and confess and ask God to help you. So listen to a few of these verses. I'm just going to read you a few verses of what God says in being slow to anger. Psalms 103, verse 8. He says this, The Lord is merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Now we say we're Christians, but are we exhibiting <coughs> those attributes? Because listen to Psalms 145, 8, very similar. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, <coughs> and abound in steadfast love. Boy, Proverbs is where it really gets right down to the very far from the matter. Whoever, Proverbs 16 32 says this, whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit is better than he who takes a sin. Proverbs 15 verse 18. And, and boy, I know this one to be true and you do too. We've all dealt with it. Might have been that a hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. You see, there's, no, there's really not much room for middle ground there, is there? We're either going to be one who stirs up strife, or we're going to be one that tries to bring down contention. There is that unknown variable because sometimes we're dealing with things outside of ourselves, but we should always try and take the godly approach when we're dealing with people. Amen. So that at the end of the day, whatever happens with whoever the people are we may be dealing with, the other people, fellow Christians first, and then the world second, can look at us and say, wow, they really handle things in a godlike manner. That's where we need to be all the time. And that's where I have to challenge myself. Am I handling things in a God-like manner? And it's a learning curve for all of us. Because we're all nature the same whether we want to admit it or not. <laughs> there are people that can tweak our last buttons. Hello? And don't look at your spouse and say, yeah, honey, it's you. <laughs> Even if it's true. <laughs> Ephesians 4, verses 26 and 27 says this. Be angry and do not sin. Do not. These are commands, by the way, when they say that. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. So that ought to tell us real quick, when we stay in a state of anger, we are automatically opening ourselves up to the enemy to come in and start stealing things that are gifts from God. And the reason he can do that is because when we are unjustly angry, we have severed relationship with God. There is that place where he, 
Now remember, judicially, if you're saved, you're right with God. But you can't cut off that communication with God. They were going about that in Sunday school this morning. You can get out of the way. Like the prodigal son, you can get out of the way. Go your own way for a while. And you've lost communication with the Father. A very dangerous place to be. Verse 20, it says, For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. We need to be the righteousness of God in Christ. But if all people see are angry people walking around stirring up strife and contention, they're not seeing Christ. They're seeing you showing yourself. I mean, let's call it like it is. I'm calling it ace and ace mistakes. Hey, let's go for it. Because we can be better people. We're following godly principles. And we are all susceptible, like I said. This is for all of us. We're all going to get frustrated. Like I said, even with your spouse, maybe you get frustrated. But for those that have been married for many, many years, we're going to tell you, if they've had a successful marriage, don't let the sun go down your anger. Because you can sit there and stew all night and hit them over the head with a clothes hanger. <laughs> But then it'll be all right the next morning, won't it, sister? I called Sherry and her clothes hangers. If anybody wants to know how to get her for Christmas, get mom in a motorcycle helmet and Sherry's But what is wrath? Because we need to be swift to listen, slow to speak, or murmur. And slow to wrath. Wrath is when you put legs to your anger. You be angry. We all get angry. Do we not? Is there anybody here that, that they, they're so close to glory they won't get angry anymore? Uh, I didn't think so. Okay. We got that out of work. But when you go from a place where you're kind of angry inside yourself, and you start lashing at others around you, whether it's your family or whoever. And you start saying things, and trust me, once you said something without the Spirit of God behind it, you ain't get that cat back in the back. It's out. Mm -hmm. Your wife might forget what she fixed for dinner last night, but you say something wrong, and I guarantee you 30 years later, you're going to hear about it at some point again. <laughs> I'm telling the truth. We're the same with a man. I mean, I'm not just picking on women this morning. I'm talking it works both ways. We, we remember those negative things that we make sure of. That's our sinful nature, wanting to remember the negative instead of the wonderful things in between. Many times there's wonderful things that we're missing. That's one of the things I am loving. You know, Chris, you know we're, we're, we're middle-aged now. I'm loving it. I don't worry about the stuff I used to. Now, I admit that I'd like to have some of my health back. But isn't it nice just the things that, and you can relate to Daniel. Man, we used to, us got as young guys, we get fighting mad, you know, if somebody's getting our case, well, we're ready. Let's go, boys, outside, let's rumble. But now, I mean, whatever. <laughs> Going down the street, bug somebody else. I'm, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to enjoy the beauty God's created around me. I'm going to love my family, the little things. Just the times me and my dad sitting there, and he's in his recliner, and I'm in the one beside him. We're sitting there just watching the whole lesson together, just talking. Those are precious. Those are the things that, that matter. And I enjoy life now because God has taught me what's important. And yeah, I can still get upset. There is a huge difference between being upset about something and being angry about something. I can stand for you and say this morning, regardless of what has transpired in my life, even recent events, I am angry with no one and want to see everyone reach their highest potential with God. And if I can do anything to help facilitate that, I want to be the kind of the Jesus. How about you? Amen. So that's where it's at. But wrath, it is a smoldering anger that holds a grudge against someone. That's what wrath really is. Any of y'all ever been 
just a mad and, and just the thought of revenge can send your thoughts. I know we've all been there. There's been a few people, like I said, I'd like to hug until they turned every color of the bag of <laughs> bag of skills. And then hug them a little tighter still. But I found out I wasn't hurting them. I was hurting me. And more importantly, I was hurting my father who I had him. If they need to get straightened out, God will straighten them out way better than I can ever get them. Amen. Truth is, a lot of times He needs to straighten me out. Mm -hmm. It's my attitude He needs to work out. <coughs> this has been long enough. I thought it was going to. I'm sorry, guys. I don't mean to be long with it, but this is important stuff. Man. Those who understand something, there is two types of anger. There is a difference between what we would call objective anger and subjective anger. You say, okay, well, explain it to me. Objective anger is justifiable anger. When you see somebody, like you see on TV, just right hand on the news, get pummeled over there with a ball bat or shoved in front of a subway or, or children being beat up at school, that is a justifiable anger. Jesus showed us what justifiable or objective anger looks like when he went to the temple and they had Roman coins because they were in what? The Roman Empire. And then there was certain currency for the temple and the money changers were sitting there taking a cut off the top every time they went to change coins so they could give their tithes to the temple. And Jesus sat down and watched that. I can see him sitting there watching it and getting hotter and hotter. It wasn't, and he never sinned. But he did clean house. Maybe. There comes a time when the man of God's got to clean house. Don't let it upset you when it happens. Pray for him when it happens. Because there's going to be times when the enemy sticks in and what he's doing is he's trying to steal from the people of God. He's being led by the religious spirit, and a religious spirit is different than a righteous spirit. A religious spirit is straight out of the pit of hell. A righteous spirit is straight out of the glory of heaven. You cannot walk in a righteous walk and burn with subjective anger. Subjective anger is when you believe you are justified in your anger even when you aren't. You understand what I'm saying now? Right. Subjective anger is when you believe you are justified. I'm right in that. I have a right to be angry. Even when you everything the Bible says that you, you don't have a right to be angry about that. Amen. There is open defiance against the word of God. And I'm going to these next four points, unfortunately, I'm going to make this real quick. If you will turn me real quick over to 2 Chronicles 7. Y'all know this real well. Verses 12 through 14 with a focus on 14. And you're going to say, how in the world does this have to relate? One thing we've got to do that James is teaching us is, is we need to discern the spirits. We need to understand what is prompting people to do what they do and why and how to respond. There are some principles that are everlasting. Like I said, the moral code that God established. That's why the Ten Commandments are still as relevant today as the day God pinned them on Mount Sinai with his own finger. They have not changed. Never will change. They are etched in stone. I think that's <coughs> written in stone as perfect for it. <laughs> because they're immutable, unchangeable. What was that? Second Chronicles chapter 7, oh, verse 12. Because it kind of gives us a background. The reason I'm starting in verse 12. Solomon's temple has just been finished, it's been rededicated. The fire of God has come down. The fire of God himself. And by the way, the commentary on this, it says the fire will burn until the capture of the Assyrians. That's another story for another time. That's when you start getting the real deep, interesting details of there were 
certain things that would happen historically. But at this point in time, the Spirit of God, like a fire, listen to verse 3. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down, I'm in chapter 7. And the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. And so all of this they had their, their feast. You can read there was eight days they had their feast. And, and now, in verse 12, the Lord appears to Solomon. Boy, I bet you that was a good, that, wouldn't that be an interesting one to be a fly on the wall at? And listen to verse 12. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night. <laughs> Can't help but think of Nicodemus when I read that. And said unto him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. Listen carefully once here. He said, If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, so God's glory has just filled the temple and already he's given out warning, warning. He already knew what was going to happen in his knowledge. What we have here, he was given a warning in verse 13 of three things that would happen. One is there would be drought. We see that happen. Famine. Disease. We're watching that happen again today in our land. We say, oh, this can never happen. We have lived so richly. And yet now we have seen the exposure of how vulnerable the supply lines are. We hear the coast of the North better than anybody by virtue of hurricanes. What happens every time a hurricane comes? The shelves go bare pretty quick, do they not? Right now, Mr. Gates owns about 2%, I think I was reading, I might be wrong with them, but it's a lot of land of our farmland. China owns a lot of our farmland. Let me tell you something, if a famine hits this world, our food, these knuckleheads in Washington have done said it, it's heading overseas. They'll let our own people starve. They're letting them rot the streets. They'd rather send 100 billion to start World War III than they would to give treatment centers to people that need help that have addictions. We got a problem, and I'm telling you, it's not. We're not going to get it fixed by a new president or a new Congress or a new Senate. We're only going to get it fixed by a nation that is repentant and comes back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That's the only thing that can fix man's problems is the Lord Jesus Christ. Y'all heard of the word inversion? It's two sides of the same coin. I'm going to give you an example and we're going to walk through these real fast. Let me give you an example of one. The Bible says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, right? Well, now the inversion of that is where the Spirit of the Lord isn't, there is bondage. That is saying the same thing. That's the other side of the same coin. Now I'm going to read 714. We've been taught it left and right. Now this does fit together what we just read in James. However, we, I don't think it's ever been taught this way. I've been thinking about the inversion of what's happening. And it's what we see happening. So follow it real quickly. I'm going to go through a step. It's a four-step prescription on how things can improve. And by the way, I've told y'all before, everybody wants to pray to fix America, and I'm telling you, I don't want this world to be a better place to go to hell from. We need to fix the church to get people to heaven, because I don't care how good you make the world welcome God. Listen carefully. Verse 14, if my people, 
saying, who is who called by my name? He shall humble themselves. All right, let's start with that one. Did you know that the word humble is mentioned 81 times in the Bible? Does that mean it's important to God? What is the opposite of humility? Pride. God has a lot to say about pride. Pride comes before what? The ball. If somebody is operating in a spirit of pride, it is not from the Spirit of God. Amen. All right, I'm giving you the flip side, and I'm talking about inside the house of God. People with boastful and proud spirits, that is not of God. We need to be aware of it so we can deal with it appropriately in Christian life. Pride. Second point he gave us was to pray. Y'all don't like this one. What's the opposite of praying? Could be. But what do you do when you pray? You use your mouth as speech. Instead of using your mouth to pray, you use it to gossip and murmur. Or to put down instead of picking up. That's the opposite. That's the devilish side of what God has called good. Praying is good. Putting someone down and gossiping and murmuring is bad. Amen. So that's the opposite. We, we need to look out for that. He says, seek my face. That's the third thing. What's the opposite of seeking God's face? Seek your worldly pleasures. Too often times, the church has become way too calm. We act like the world, we sound like the world, and then we put a little bit of church on to make it look all neat and make us feel better. God's looking for a peculiar people. Chosen generation. We're supposed to be bold and brave and strong in the Lord and sharing the word of the Lord. Something so good. I can't imagine any of us as I've told before receiving a billion dollars and we, we can keep on giving, but we can give it to everybody we know and we never lose a dime. We just, as a matter of fact, we just keep on giving. Now, how many of you would be on the phone with every relative you know that you at least get along with? Just tell them, hey, come on over. I got a billion dollars for you. And they'd probably bust down every stoplight along the way to get there. <laughs> That's why we have something more precious than silver or gold. And yet we'll hide it from our own family. We've got quite a job, so then we would tell our friends. And finally, we, we like to think we're so benevolent. We go out to the world. Find the poor people. Find them down out, and we're going to help you out. Here's some money. Go to rehab, get straightened out, and when you come out, you're going to be set. What do we do? We're silent. Too often silent. We need to seek His grace. And even righteous people. By the way, this was written to the Jewish nation, but the principles behind it are timeless. Turn from their wicked ways. The opposite of this, the demonic side of this, is to embrace the world around you. Think about that for a minute. How many churches are embracing woke ideologies to try and fit in with the world? I'm not trying to fit in with the world. I'm trying to tell the world about Jesus before he comes back. Yeah. Tell them that he's the only way to heaven. Yeah. Yeah. I have no problem with saying Jesus is love because he is in fact the only source of love. He's paved the way for whosoever will that they come. But at the same point, we can't just blindly follow the world's agenda. God's called us to be sacked, to be called out. At times, running out. We 